Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Every major American city faces issues around police community relations. Cincinnati certainly is no exception. In the aftermath of the Lorenzo Collins shooting last year, community protests spurred council to seek a federal mediator to help the city and the community review existing policies and examine possible new policies. Cincinnati City Manager John Shirey unveiled the results of that mediation process 10 days ago. That proposal includes a recommendation for a nine-member civilian board appointed by the city manager to review cases of alleged police misconduct. It also recommends hiring a civilian to help run the police academy and finding a better way to promote officers other than simply test taking. These proposals have stirred a great deal of controversy. Initially, those criticisms revolved around the supposed exclusion of the FOP from the mediation process. No matter what the merits of the process issue, this morning we are going to focus on the proposal itself. To discuss where we go from here with this proposal, I am joined this morning by three people. Tyrone Yates is a member of Cincinnati City Council and is the chair of the Law and Public Safety Committee. Dr. Milton Hinton is the president of the NAACP, an organization that had input into drawing up the proposal. Keith Fangman is the president of the Fraternal Order of Police. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tyrone, I want to be clear on something. Before anything in this proposal can be implemented, does council have to approve it or can the city manager just sort of implement it by administrative fiat? No, the city manager cannot implement the proposals by administrative fiat. They will come to the law committee, which I chair, and then we will have a series of public hearings and broad public uh, input, speak to all the interest groups, and then formulate something based on the mediation proposal. So this is a proposal on the table, and your committee will now go through a process of getting more input and, and massaging it. Is that correct? So this is not an end product. No, it's not an end product. It's the beginning, really. And there's going to be a very uh, a tortuous, long, arduous, thoughtful, detailed, uh, thorough uh, review by council. Realistically, how long do you think that might go on? My impression would be, and I've been telling people who've been listening, I think about six months before we get to the end of it. Okay. Dr. Hinton, um, some of the people, some people in the community interpreted the, the proposal as somehow a criticism of the police and maybe trying to tilt the balance of influence away from the police to, uh, to criminals. What's your view on, on the relationship of this proposal to the community support of the police force? I think it will be positive. The creation and the operation of such a committee will not do anything but enhance members of the community support of and confidence in the members of the police division. That's what it's designed to do. That's what the persons who were on the committee, including the chief of police, uh, all felt that this would be not a liability, not an asset, not anything to take away anything from the policeman. That would be folly. We all know that without the policeman, we are in terrible, terrible shape. And I don't think any well-thinking persons would do anything to take away from their efficiency. Keith, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of elements to this proposal, and we'll have a chance to talk about a number of them. But certainly the key is the commission that Dr. Hinton was just mentioning. I mean, that's the centerpiece of this whole thing. From your perspective, from uh, a street cop perspective, from the FOP, recently elected FOP president, but from the street cop's point of view, how do you feel about that proposal, that part of this proposal? Well, Dan, I, I think it's important to understand that the community realized that the FOP is not opposed to civilian review. Uh, we welcome it. Uh, only through civilian review can you build um, trust between the police division and the community. Uh, if an FOP president were to say that he's opposed to civilian review in any way, shape, or form, uh, he would immediately uh, be labeled as somebody that's trying to hide something. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And I think the community needs to realize that we in fact already have two civilian review boards. 
Uh, we have OMI, the Office of Municipal Investigation, which is in every sense of the word a civilian review board. They have full subpoena power, full investigative power, and the ability to determine an officer's guilt or innocence, and then take that guilty or innocent determination and give it to the city manager for appropriate action. Uh, CPAC is the second civilian review board that we have that was formed after the Farron Crosby incident. CPAC is a 12-member citizen review panel that again has the power to review any investigations done by the police division and also has the power to compel officers to come before that committee to explain and justify their actions in cases of excessive force and use of force uh, and shots fired and they've exercised that power quite often. Uh, I guess what, what we're questioning Dan is uh, we're, we're now talking about a third civilian review board and we're wondering if a year from now if other segments of the community come forward and say this isn't cutting the mustard then there's going to be a cry for a fourth civilian review board. Well, let me ask that. W Dr. Hinton, I know that the NAACP had a representative at the mediation process. What's your view? Are we just putting one more layer, one more committee, commission there that they're all, that's duplicating what already exists? No. There are a couple things wrong when we're citing OMI as playing that role. One, OMI employees are paid by the city. OMI um, reports, the head of OMI reports to the city manager. So it is viewed as not an independent entity per se. Okay, so this would be seen as just another branch of city government. That's right. That's the way it's what, perceived. What about CPAC? What about this other committee? CPAC was put together after the, what was it, the, the Farron Crosby. Put together hurriedly. Put together, I believe, as, a, as an attempt to say, we are putting something in place. I and the uh, director of Housing Opportunities Made Equal and the uh, CEO of the Urban League uh, went to APAC early on what is it called? CPAC. 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 <laughs> Citizen Police Advisory Committee early on to find out just what is it that you're doing. Now, I happen to recommend a, a very fine person to that committee and, uh, and uh, Colonel Adams, who happens to be a member of our executive board. So I had some inkling of what was going on. I wanted to find out just what do you think your role is and what are you doing? They weren't sure. They were not clear what their functions were. They were not clear what responsibilities they had. Uh, they cannot bring folks before them, really. Well, Tyrone, <laughs> is, is what we're facing then the possibility that maybe this one commission, if we see OMI as an extension of the city manager's powers and, and offices and you know, a city agency rather than an independent review commission, and then CPAC is maybe not very well thought out, not very strong. Is one, one of the possibilities here to eliminate that and make this new commission the, the, the real civilian review commission? I certainly can't speak for all of council, but speaking as the chair of the law committee, certainly that's the essence. As a matter of fact, the current chairperson of CPAC has already sent a communication to the city manager saying that let's collapse CPAC if city council agrees to this civilian review board uh, process. The fact is that CPAC is not a civilian review board. It is advisory to the city manager who makes these decisions and OMI is not a civilian review board. And I think the question that you asked Keith or the question that ought to be asked is does he support a civilian review board? So the, the essence is OMI and CPAC both report directly to the city manager who then acts on their recommendations, but on his judgment. You're saying a civilian review board would be different exactly how? It's different in the sense that uh, it represents kind of a hybrid because OMI would still be related to the civilians providing uh, input. It provides a broader, more institutional way for a broad range of citizens to provide support to those decisions that the city manager would make. In the final analysis, 
it's going to be the city manager's call anyway. Okay. It still would be the city manager's call. Keith, do you support that? Well, you know, I'm hearing a lot of criticism this morning about OMI and about CPAC and about how OMI is not independent enough and CPAC doesn't have enough power. So we need to ask some tough questions here. If we're going to create a third civilian review board, are we going to abolish OMI completely when it comes to investigating the police division? Nobody's yet brought that up. And you asked from the perspective of a beat cop, Dan, so I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. A beat cop looks at it like this. If you're involved in a shooting, okay, you have to go through seven, and I repeat, seven lengthy investigations before your name can be cleared. You have to be investigated by internal. You have to be investigated by homicide. You have to be investigated by OMI. You have to be investigated by the county prosecutor. You have to be investigated by CPAC, the FBI, the Justice Department. That's seven separate independent investigations. And I think there just has to come a point when not only the police division, but the community at large says, just how many investigations do we need when an officer is involved in a situation so, like this? But, but then what are you saying? Are you saying, in fact, you don't want the Civilian re Review Board? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying we've got seven already. Do we need an eighth one? And if we are going to have an eighth one, which of these are we going to cut out? Why? Because we're talking about a process that takes up to a year, and an officer is left twisting in the rent wind, and that's inappropriate. Dr. Hinton, why aren't seven enough? I think he's giving CPAC more credit and more responsibility than to do. CPAC does not routinely review uh, instances of uh, police misconduct that comes before it. I have sent complaints that come into our office about police me behavior to CPAC, and they're just not set up to deal with that. I think. So to count them as a routine review board is a bit. Well, let's, okay. say, let's, let's say, say there's six. Then. Okay. Okay. It, okay. You're, you're still. You would say the CPAC isn't effective, and we need an effective yeah. civilian review board. Oh yes. Would be your point. Oh yes, I've already said that. But I do want to say something else about OMI, that that I neglected to say. OMI, by its by its own admission, of its last three directors, will say that they have never been properly staffed, and they take a number of their cases and give to internal investigation, which means, in essence, that they give the, one has the appearance of an independent entity doing investigations when, in fact, a large percentage of the case that come to them was done by internal review. But that, that, that's changing. OMI has seen a, a significant amount in the increase in its staffing levels. Uh, a number of months ago, about eight months ago, they hired a 25-year uh, veteran of the FBI to assist in conducting investigations. So I, I think we have to ask ourselves, is OMI working, and should it continue to be in, in force, or we should throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of OMI? Uh, well, well let, let me, Tyrone, let me turn to you on this one. Let's say we eliminate it, we substitute it, this new commission for CPAC. Secondly, isn't OMI basically not a civilian review board, but a, an investigative arm that this new board could use, or the city manager can use, or a department could use? Isn't that, isn't that what OMI really is? Well, that's right. As a matter of fact, uh, OMI investigates uh, complaints not just for the police right. division, but for any division of the city of Cincinnati or any of its 7,000 employees where there is an allegation of misconduct of one kind or another. Now, the feature, I believe, that's associated with the recommendations of the mediation panel is that the, the civilians who would represent the broad panel won't have the time to do the investigation themselves. And for, that, uh, for those things, they would rely to some extent upon OMI's uh, support and assistance. You know, we're not going to settle this this morning, and I want to get a couple of other topics. I'm just trying to get this. I mean, obviously, you're going to be doing this for the next six months in the community. A couple other topics. One of the proposals is that, in this 10-day-old proposal, is that the police training academy be headed by a civilian. Um, what, what, what do you think of that? Dan, I, I think that is absolutely preposterous. That's like taking an 18-year-old man who just graduated from high school who wants to be a United States Marine and sending him to Paris Island for Marine Corps boot camp training and instead of being met by a Marine Corps drill instructor, he's met by a civilian.
who's never been a Marine before, who's never been in an uh, officer needs assistance situation, who's never been in a high speed pursuit, who's never been in foot pursuit of a drug suspect, to say that a civilian who has no prior police experience is capable of running a police academy and filtering down no knowledge whatsoever of police work I I is preposterous. Dr. Hinton, why do you agree with that proposal, th that part of the proposal that a civilian ought to head up the academy? And if so, why? No, I know less about this than I do the other. The commission. Yeah, yeah th there were people on the committee uh, who were law enforcement people, the uh, uh, Mr. Ryan and others. The thinking behind that, as I believe it to be, is that there is much interaction of civilians now with the police division in terms of training and other aspects. And this was an attempt not to take someone off the street who is a c civilian who might have some complaint against the, uh, the police division and put them at its helm, but rather that there is a feeling among a great number of people that the training that is uh, being given at the division now is perhaps a bit overly aggressive uh, and that um, there's also yeah. Let, let me get a re I see you yeah. reacting. Is it yeah. overly aggressive? No, absolutely not. And, 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 and I, I have to, to, to take a offense to that statement. The, the, the training that police officers receive at the police academy is defensive training. Our, our entire use of force policy is one in which an officer may not use any force uh, more than reasonable to effect an arrest. You, you, you know, the, when, you, when you talk about aggressive training, uh, that gives the impression that we're, we're teaching or encouraging excessive force. And Dr. Hinton's right. Our academy training right now is filled with civilians who come in off the street and speak to the officers about relations with the black community, relations with the Appalachian community, relations with the gay community, the, the mental health community. And, and, and that's fine. But to, to say that you're going to have a civilian running a police academy training center is ludicrous. Let me, let me yeah, respond. And we're going to be running out of time, sure. so let's focus on this. And we certainly will focus. And and uh, I respect both of my colleagues here, but uh, both actually um, are not correct. This is the proposal of the chief of police of the city of Cincinnati. And the reason that you have a civilian administrator as opposed to a head is because the rotation for the police academy at the captain's level has been for two years. And you lose too much. The so chief keep them says, there longer. Pardon, keep them there for five years, pardon, then. Pardon, keep them for six years. Well, okay. Let, let, okay. Let, let's let Tyron and finish. Okay. okay. Pardon the officer. Go ahead. That the rotation is is uh, too short before the captain leaves. The fact of the matter is, is that most of the training is going to continue to be done by uniformed personnel, and largely this post is a uh, is an administrative uh, post uh, in the first place. So you're suggesting that just the length of time could be, rather than two-year rotation, a five-year rotation. Is that a possibility? Well, I think that anything is, is a possibility. A possibility. And, uh, but but I, I, don't, uh, I don't agree that the reason that the civilian has been asked to do it is because the training has been over-aggressive. And I disagree with the FOP president who says that by having a civilian uh, chief that you uh, dilute uh, the training. We're out of time. Obviously, we've only scratched the surface. This is a very complex situation, a very complex proposal. We're going to continue to follow it on Newsmakers, and thanks for being here this morning. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Okay. February is Black History Month. Stay tuned. After the break, we will talk to the founder of what is becoming a mainstay of that celebration in Cincinnati. Welcome back. During 75 years Americans have observed February as Black History Month, communities have developed their own traditions and ways to celebrate. One of the emerging traditions in Cincinnati is the African American Ball, which will be held this coming Saturday night. I am joined this morning by the founder of the ball, William Mallory Sr. Mr. Mallory, of course, is the retired majority leader of the Ohio House of Representatives, and more to the point, this morning, the founder of the Mallory Center for Community Development and the African American Historical Ball. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm happy to be here. What is the Mallory Center? Uh, because the ball really supports the center and is a program of the center. What's, what's the center? 
Well, let me explain it this way. In a sense, the center is an oasis in, a, in the desert. It services the people in the Hindhoe Millville area. And at that center, we have programs, uh, educational programs. Uh, uh, we have a program now called Project Learn, uh, where, wherein we have collaborated with the uh, African American Studies Department at the University of Cincinnati to tutor young uh, uh, students, uh, college students come in and work with them. Uh, we have a very interesting program, in addition to that one, uh, the Computer Cop Program. And it began because the, the kids in that area would throw rocks at the police. They would uh, actually uh, steal items from the police car. And one of the uh, residents of that area, a policeman by the name of Al Brown, who grew up in that area, decided that he would start a program called Computer Cop so that a better relationship could be developed between the police and the, the young people in that community, and uh, it, it's, it's highly successful. But in addition to that, the kids who participate in it learn uh, academic subjects. Um, now, the, the, the historical ball, which this year will be the fourth yes. year, it's not, just, it's not just a fundraiser, although it is a fundraiser. It's not just a fundraiser. It, it, you have an educational purpose to this as well, right? Yes. Uh, the, the idea of, of having the ball was to uh, make history uh, interesting, uh, to, in a sense, reenact previous history and, 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 in some instances, contemporary history, so that people got a very good uh, view of history. Uh, one of the things that we do is we encourage people to choose their favorite hero in history and come to the ball and, and, and that, atti that attire of that person. Now what that does, that forces them to do research. And if I were to walk up to that person and, so, and they tell me they're uh, whoever they are, I would expect them to be very conversant on that subject. So you're a little, qui little pop quiz at the ball. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In fact, we have some pictures of, of some of the people. Now he, this is you. Oh, that's me. That's uh, up on the screen now. Yeah. Who were you dressed as? Well, I was not uh, dressed as a particular uh, person in history, but I was dressed because it's an African-American historical ball. I was okay. dressed. Uh, so this is the classic teacher-student relationship. They couldn't ask you any questions, but you could ask them some questions. We have another one. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have this is uh, Tom Thacker and his wife, who yes. those of us who are old enough to remember when he played for UC. Um, what are they dressed as? Well, he looks like, uh, wasn't he Pickett? Yeah, the yeah, old. Yeah, he was. He was a Pickett, the, the old uh, rodeo guy. Yeah. So uh, you, you could walk up to him and, and, and quiz him. He couldn't just dress up any way he wanted to. He had to have some reason for that. Uh, so th th there is a, an educational point to the, to the historical ball. Yeah. The, the important part is to honor historical figures who will inspire people to accomplish things well beyond what they accomplished. And how many people this Saturday night do you expect to, to attend the ball this year? Well, I think we'll have about 1,000 people. And, and how much money do you hope to raise for, for the center and for the, those programs you were talking about in Millville? Well, I don't know the, uh, the exact amount, but let me just uh, answer you honestly. I hope to, to raise as much as we possibly can. Okay. And I, we do have a, a telephone number that people can call if uh, they're interested. It's up on the screen now, 591-2255. So if they're interested in finding out about tickets or they get turned on by dressing up in historic uh, costume, uh, they, they can do that. Obviously, we, we're, we have less than a minute left here, so we're almost out of time. This is something you've thrown yourself into since you've left public life. Obviously, you care about this. Well, it's, one, uh, it's almost like putting on a Broadway production. People don't know how hard people work to put this on. There are many facets to it. It's, it's much more than what I've described. All of, the, all of the various components of this is like putting on a, uh, as I said, a Broadway play. Well, listen, thank you very much for being with us. You have, for 20 years, you were my representative, and you're uh, somebody I want to have back, and we'll talk politics on this show in the future. But today, we were talking history. That's so right. thanks for being I'm, here. I'm glad you didn't uh, talk politics today, because I wasn't going to discuss politics. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, and thank you for being with us this morning. Join us again next week, when we will again talk with the men and the women who are shaping the future of Cincinnati.